excited to celebrate our friend Abi Koram, and he's got a new book coming out in just a couple of weeks on Wednesday. So I know that everybody has a QR code in front of them for the new book. You can also see one of our booksellers up at the front desk if you want to place an order. We've got book plates we can get signed tonight. A little bit about the new book. Um, Adi weaves a sexy and heartfelt romance that starts with a mistaken identity meet cute between a substitute teacher and aspiring master sommelier. You can see we've got some wine here. We've got a lot of teachers in the house today. <laughs> <laughs> so touching on topics of mental health, internalizing familial pressures, the ups and downs of pursuing one's passion, and how life can sometimes take you on a path you never planned on. You'll not only fall in love with Farzan and David falling in love, but also with the family and friends and community that encompasses and supports these two. And the best part, it's set in Kansas City, where he was born and raised, and lots of mentions about Kansas City, super fun throughout, recognizable neighborhoods, established KC institution, and of course, the Chiefs. <laughs> You'll be here in conversation with Cassandra McKenna, our children's coordinator here at Watermark, and let's all welcome them. Thank you. that someone on the internet gave to me, um, which is that it is replete with a uh, lovingly rendered depiction of food, wine, and butts. <laughs> um, yes. I'm like, you know what? What more could anyone... Oh, you may. You're going to have to repeat that now. Yeah. Not... Oh. Oh, that's definitely way louder now. Go team. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, so as someone on the internet just said, it is, uh, it is uh, filled to the brim with lovingly rendered descriptions of food, wine, and butts. Um, I like that. What was, that was a few words, right? Do, you want, yes, do I need yes. to say more? I feel like you already got the flat yeah, copy. We're all good. Um, it's about food, wine, and butts. I mean, it, I, I've read it, and it, you know, it, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, it starts, like Rebecca was saying, it starts with the sexiest and most hilarious me cute I've ever read. Farzan uh, <laughs> is, uh, he's a substitute teacher who works at his parents' Iranian restaurant uh, it's in his meantime to supplement his, you know, like his, uh, his paychecks. And so he was just going to have a third date, the third date, but he gets stood up. So what's better to solve, like, to, to make your heart feel better after a breakup. Fries, wine, and friends. So, we're, none of us are going through a breakup tonight. We're in celebration. So We, we hope. We have. Raise your hand if you're going through a breakup tonight, actually. Okay, so, I thought the night was about to get really dramatic. So, tonight we have wine, and we have friends. So, uh, but the, it all starts at the wine bar. And so Farzan goes there, and he has a bout of mistaken identity, and David happens to work there. It is the most adorable meet cute. Um, you just have to read it to, you know, find out the rest. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, so this is your first adult novel, and it is also your first romance novel. It is. So I want to ask you, what challenges did you face from transitioning from, to, uh, from YA to adult? And how is this process different or maybe the same as your previous, writing your previous books? I would say, um, I don't know that there were any challenges. It was just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience has been that uh, the younger your reader is, the, more, the harder it is to write for them. And so like picture books are probably the hardest thing that anyone will ever write. Middle grade is not quite as hard, but still really rough. Young adult is easier still. And for adults, like, the sky is the limit. You can write about alcohol, you can write about boning, you can write about whatever yes. you want, and get away with it, and the Moms for Liberty, while they might still come out with the pitchforks, are less likely to come out with the pitchforks, because most schools aren't stalking adult romances about wine and boning. Um, as far as 
um, making the transition, it was really, uh, like a lot of people, I was really depressed during the pandemic. I don't know if you all remember that. We had that a while back. It's also kind of still going on. Anyway, um, I was depressed like a lot of other people, and a friend of mine said I should try reading romance novels because I couldn't read anything. And I used to read like a, one or two books a week, and I was reading n no books per month. Uh, and so it had been a really long time since I like sat down with uh, romance novels. And so I went to the library and got basically like 20 of them that were recommended uh, by various friends. And I like shotgunned them. Like I read one a day and I was like, oh, that's right. I remember what joy is like now. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, you know what? Maybe I should try writing romances because these seem really fun. I also like writing about adults. I just never had before because uh, I used to say adults were boring. And I still think a lot of adult literature is boring because one can only read so many novels about getting divorced and being diagnosed with celiac, both of which are... <laughs> No, both of which are hard, and I'm sorry for anyone who deals with those. Do we need three books about that in the same season? I don't know. We already have one Jonathan Franzen. Do we need more? I don't know. Is Jonathan Franzen right behind me? If he is, if he is you have to tell me. Um, but so I'd always thought adults were boring, and then I just realized that certain adults are boring, and romance novels are interesting. Uh, and so I was like, yeah, I just threw myself into it. And I am... Uh, my, my agent, uh, who I you know, talk about all my projects with, uh, her name is Molly O'Neill and she lives in New York City. And when she first moved to New York in her 20s after college, um, at the time the, the, the head food writer for the New York Times was also named Molly O'Neill. And so my friend 20-year-old Molly O'Neill could get reservations at the nicest restaurants in town by calling and saying, hey, can I get a reservation for two for Molly O'Neill? They would scramble and think that she was a critic uh, and then she would just show up as like a, a poor, a poor twenty something with her poor twenty something date, uh, and I was like, Molly, I'm gonna steal this and put it in a story someday, and so that is why this novel is actually dedicated to Molly for letting me steal her backstory. You know, I had actually wondered that because you dedicate that to her in the beginning of the book for stealing uh, Molly. I'm stealing your backstory, yeah. so that's that is it that's exactly. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, so you read a bunch of romance novels. Uh, so I know in, in romance, uh, there's a little bit of gatekeeping, uh, like bodice rippers for the most part, everybody's hot, you know, everyone. You can't be in a romance novel if you're not hot. But Farzan and David are 37. They're not in the peak of their life where they have, you know, washboard abs, and you know, they're, they're not, you know, the id guys. You know, they're just your average guys. I had, I had a friend who described them as normal people hot. Yeah! <laughs> or, as you might say, a Missouri Nine. Was that... <laughs> so I noticed in your work, you know, it's really important for that inclusivity and that body positivity. Was that, like, you knew you wanted that to be in your romance novel? I do think I, I knew going in, because when I was reading tons of romance and being really happy, I was also like, oh, all these people are in their 20s and like still have collagen, um, <laughs> what must that be like? Uh, and I was like, and you know, I would talk to other friends about romances and they were all like, yeah, so many of them are about being in your 20s. And there's a few about older protagonists. One of my favorites uh, is one of Jasmine Guillory's uh, where the, the, the couple are like in their 50s and it's like a woman, uh, a woman from California falling in love with like a butler in the Royal Palace in London. I'm blanking on the name. Does anyone remember that the one? The Royal Wedding. The Royal Wedding, yes. Yeah. It was delightful. And I was like, yes, old people are allowed to fall in love too. Not that being in your 50s is old. Any, according to TikTok, anything above 25 is old. So in that sense, you know, people that aren't in their 20s are allowed to fall in love. And, you know, I just turned 40 this year. Uh, and I think a lot of millennials have very similar delayed milestones in life because of, you know, recessions and pandemics and world events. Uh, and so I really wanted to, like, write about the millennial experience. And, you know, most of us have knees that pop and gray hairs now. <laughs> well, and I think that's a really important uh, aspect of romance that isn't commonly explored because it's like love comes in so many shapes, sizes, and, you know, appearances. So why shouldn't romance should be, you know, represented in all those different shapes? Absolutely. Uh, so you capture so well the difficulties of navigating modern dating and exploring new relationships, uh, those cringy feelings you feel when exploring that intimacy. Uh, before you started writing, were there certain topics and themes in adult relationships you knew you wanted to explore? Um, I don't know that I did have particular themes. 
Uh, I tend to never know what I'm doing until after I've done it. I tend to kind of come up with my characters first and then throw them into a book and see how that book goes. Uh, so in that sense, not really. I do think I had sort of general ideas about exploring what it feels like to be kind of coming up on your 40s and not being what everyone tells you you're supposed to be at that age. Um, beyond that, I think I kind of just uh, followed my bliss in a way. So, much, you know, romance is a genre of love and indulgence, and so I indulged myself and wrote about things that made me smile, made me laugh, uh, made me occasionally cringe, because I think a, a small but healthy amount of cringe is useful in any <laughs> book, just to keep it grounded. Um, and then I also, uh, while I was about halfway through the first draft, I got COVID, and uh, then I don't remember writing the rest of that first draft because I had terrible brain fog, but didn't know until after I had finished the book, sent it to my editor, and my editor is like, what the, what the heck is this? They don't go anywhere or do anything for the second half of the book. And I was like, oh, I don't remember writing that. I'm just gonna erase the book and start over. And it's like, oh, it's not that bad. I'm like, you don't have to, like, I appreciate you trying to manage my emotions, but it's actually okay. I know it's bad, and I'm gonna throw it away and start over. Um, and I think that said, having, vague recollections of what I had written the first time, I was able to kind of identify some of the things that I really liked, including uh, like a focus on a friend group and um, on sort of the, the joy of queer community. Like one of the side plots is that Farzan plays in a, is a, Farzan plays in a queer kickball league in Kansas City, Missouri, a queer adult kickball league. Um, I don't know if you have any of those in Wichita, but they're blowing up in Kansas City right now. I don't know why everyone in Kansas City is playing kickball again, but it's a thing. <laughs> we should get that started yeah. here. And uh, so I think in some ways, yeah, like reflecting on what had intrigued me the first time around, let me hone in on what intrigued me when I wrote a non-COVID draft. Uh, so speaking of romance, typical romance things, uh, one of the reoccurring things is the uh, writers sometimes stay in their own worlds for a while. Do you plan on expanding the world that Frazan and David live in? I know they have a close, you know, friendship, and sometimes that explores those relationships. Indeed, uh, actually, it's a it's a trio of books. Farzan and his two best friends, Arya and Ramin, are all Iranian American and all queer, and have known each other since elementary school. And each of them gets to be the, the star of a novel. I'm so excited, especially about Arya. When you read this book, the amount of salacious quips that Arya comes up with, oh my gosh, they are hilarious. Thank you. I am quite like, proud of he's that. my favorite character. And that, I, that question came from me wanting a whole book involving him and his own romance. Well, he does finally get one. Good. I'm sorry. Arya is a. Um, a uh, consummate hookup artist and uh, insists he's never going to fall in love, and so of course he has to fall in love. So in this novel, uh, David is studying beco uh, to become a master sommelier uh, and working at the wine bar named Aspire in Kids City. So naturally wine is a reoccurring subject. Uh, warning, the vast amount of wine descriptions and pairings will make you hungry and want to try them all. Good. <laughs> uh, what I want to know, just from like when I was reading it, did you have to do extensive research on wine and the process of becoming a sommelier, or um, is that like a personal passion? Did I have to do research on wine itself? No. Um, unless you just count drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> That's research. Um, I did occasionally, if it had been a while since I tasted the wine, sometimes I would like go back and look up the tasting notes of, from someone else. Um, just because, you know, I do drink a lot of wine. Uh, as far as the process of becoming a master sommelier, I actually did do uh, a fair amount of research with that. Um, actually, um, reading websites, reading books, and also uh, there was a documentary about uh, becoming a master sommelier. And then there was also a really great, like, movie, fiction movie, whatever you would call a fiction. <laughs> I was like, in books we call that fiction or nonfiction. What do we call it in movies? One is a documentary, the other is just a movie, I guess. Anyway, there was a great movie about that as well. Okay. Um, and so yeah, I did do a fair amount of research on that. And then I realized that it didn't matter that much because all this information about being a sommelier was like getting cut because they're like a deep focus on the boning. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter how the test works that much. In fact, at one point, like, the test he takes was, like, in the novel. 
And my editor's like, Adib, no one needs to see that. You can just cut it and move on to him uh, you know, getting the results. And I was like, oh my god, you're right. I don't need to bog everyone down with five pages of more blind tastings. As fun as that is for me. So, yeah. I do tons of research and then ignore it all <laughs> in the service of the plot. Uh, another question about Aspire. Were there any places in Kansas City, uh, wine bars or anywhere else that inspired uh, As Aspire <laughs> and its rise? Yes, Aspire is um, Tannen Wine Bar and Kitchen uh, with the serial numbers filed off. Uh, yes, they're both at 15th and Walnut. They both have ginkgo trees on, on oh, like shading the patio outside. Literally same decor, same delicious fries. Uh, or pommes frites, as we say. Um, literally most of the menu items have, have been served at Tannen at one point or another. I, I interviewed um, the general manager of Tannen, Barry, uh, as I was working on the book to like get insights into, uh, how, what, into like, what it's like actually working at a restaurant like that. Because I don't, I've never worked in a restaurant actually. No, I worked in a the theater. You couldn't tell from your writing. Thank you. Well, I, yeah, I had a lot of research eating at restaurants, and then uh, Barry was a great resource. And so, yeah, it's, it's just tannin with the serial numbers filed off. Okay. Uh, food is also a reoccurring subject in your novel, uh, uh, especially since Barzan's family run an Iranian restaurant named Shiraz Bistro. Uh, that also serves as a pillar of its community. Are there Persian restaurants that inspire Shiraz Bistro, or is that a, you know, making of your own imagination? Sadly, Kansas City doesn't have uh, like a really good Persian restaurant right now. I don't know if we have any Persian restaurants. There was one for a while, and I think it was not very good and then closed. Um, growing up, we had one called uh, Kebab House, which was delicious, and then that closed. And then when I was in my 20s, we had one called Caspian Bistro, which was delicious, and that closed. Um, but so many diaspora communities, kind of their first anchors in their new homes are restaurants. And so in some ways it was just a combination of all the Persian restaurants I've been to and loved, and just my general feelings about the diaspora community. I like that. Uh, so you beautifully capture the mental health effects of just a couple things to mention, like the familiar, uh, familiar pressures of you know, my, meeting milestones and just that not living up to your own personal expectations and hitting those milestones of where you think you're supposed to be at a certain age in life. Uh, can you speak on the importance of representing mental health in your own writing? That's so interesting because I don't think, as I was writing it, I was thinking about mental health. I was just thinking more generally of the feeling that I often had in my life of, like I thought I was supposed to be grown up by now, uh, and it turns out I'm not. Um, I still have more growing to do. Um, but I think, in general, as a writer, I'm really uh, interested in authentically portraying the human experience. And my human experience has often been one of uh, not quite living up to my own expectations or of trying things and failing and having to pivot and try new things. I mean, I've gone through many, many careers myself. Uh, I certainly did not expect to be a, a writer, uh, and certainly not like making my living writing. Uh, I got laid off from my old day job during the pandemic, which I had planned on doing for quite a while because I really liked it. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't know, honesty is, is I think a crucial part of my writing process. And so that's just sort of a natural consequence of that. I found it really refreshing because it really, it, it grounded Farzan and David, like feeling like they were going through things you could truly relate to. No matter what your age is, whether you're 20 or 37, I feel like some of those things are universal and we don't always outgrow them or, you know, go through them at the same time. Indeed. Though some people still have collagen. <laughs> I'm not jealous, it's fine, don't worry about it. So, community is a strong presence in your novel. Uh, from the supportive and accountable friendships, uh, Farzan, it, uh, his friends are able to call him out on his shit um, in a healthy way. Uh, and they but, make it up with donuts. Yeah, and make it up with donuts. And his family, although they might have you know some backhanded comments, are there for him and support him. Uh, the wine and the meals that are mentioned and all meant to be shared together, that's all community. What inspirations from your own life uh, do you draw on to sh show that community? Ooh, I mean, I'm really lucky to have a, uh, a really close friend group 
we hang out pretty frequently, uh, doing Taco Tuesdays and sometimes drinking too much wine. Uh, in fact, we had a birthday on Wednesday and so drank too much wine, uh, played a board game, it was wonderful. Uh, I think all of my life I've been really fortunate in having amazing friends and family. In fact, uh, one of my family came down with me today purely because I didn't want to make a three hour drive all by myself, my sister Afsane. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Um, but I love and appreciate you. And so I'm, I feel like not everyone has that in their life. Um, and so for me, I hope it heals people to see that and maybe encourage them to go out and reach for people. Um, because I think if you've been knocked down a lot in life, it becomes easy to like guard your heart and not reach for other people. And I wanted to show that it can be worth it. And and when you read this book, you'll see that you'll see uh, Farzan and David both go through that, where they don't reach out to their community, and their community reaches back out to them and embraces them. It's really beautiful. Um, I think that's all I have, question-wise. Do we want to open it up to the audience? I love audience questions. <gasps> we do have a microphone for you. <laughs> So I can't wait to sell this book. It's so fun. Thank and I can't you. wait to just go to 15th and Walnut and check it out. Um, Tell them deep sent you. I will. I will. I will. I'll get on the streetcar from somewhere and go down there. So um, you've done a lot of research by drinking a lot of wine. Are you a, sh do you cook? I do cook. Persian dishes? I do or... cook Persian dishes and not Persian dishes. I'm actually, during the pandemic, like a lot of people, I got really into Italian. Uh, so I do make fresh pasta from scratch and I do make fresh focaccia from scratch. Um, I also, like, growing up, I watched a lot of Food Network, especially Rachel Ray's 30 Minute Meals. And so I can whip together a lot of food in like 30 to 45 minutes based on what's in my pantry. Um, yeah, I really enjoy cooking. Will you share with us your favorite Persian recipe so we can? Uh, exploit that recipe when we're marketing your new book. <laughs> I will tell you, do you, uh, there is a Persian cookbook called Bottom of the Pot okay. uh, by Naz Daravian, and uh, her recipe for Khoresh Fesinjan, uh, or a, a stew of chicken and ground walnuts and pomegranate molasses, is my favorite, and her cookbook has the recipe I always use. Um, my family, actually, my, my family, uh, all the women in my family are amazing cooks, especially my brother's, uh, my father's sister. Um, but like a lot of uh, home cooks, she's not really great at transmitting those recipes. She'll like give them orally, and then you'll make it at home, and it won't quite be right. And she'll be like, "Did you do this?" And I'm like, "No, you didn't tell me to do that." I was like, "Oh, really? Do do that too? However much you, you'll know how much is right." And I'm like, "No, I won't know how much is right. I need to practice more." Um, so yeah, so bottom of the pot, I really trust their recipes. Do we have another question from the crowd? Oh, I see one in the back. It's all good, you gotta get your step count up. Yeah. I guess this is more of a comment. I come to you from Darius the Great is Not Okay. I read it, I have it in my classroom very happily. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I love it, I recommend it. I think that it's one of the just like most gentle, sweet stories of this friendship and um, between these boys. And I'm curious what your thoughts are that it's been banned. To me, I'm like, what in the world? But I also am very upfront with my students and say I don't censor my bookshelves and very happily will recommend things. So I, I guess I'm, it's kind of a statement, very beautiful story, but also wanting to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, it definitely sucks. Uh, I think, you know, the Moms for Liberty in these groups are banning books. Uh, they're banning books with queer characters, they're banning books with black and brown characters, they're banning books um, with characters that have been victims of sexual violence, they're banning books that have, uh, you know, kids, that are kids of uh, incarcerated parents. Uh, and the fact is, nearly every school in this country has students that fit those criteria. And they're banning the books because they can't yet ban the students, but that's what they really want to. And I think it's the height of moral cowardice to look at any child and tell them they don't belong in public school or in the public sphere. Um, 
So it definitely sucks to be told that like I, as a human being, am an inappropriate topic for children. Uh, it sucks to be called a groomer. And I encourage anyone out here to pay attention to your school board elections and vote in your school board and library elections if Wichita does library boards. Every city does libraries their own way. In Kansas City, the suburbs of Kansas City, uh, we have like a library board that we actually have to vote for every so often. And um, in fact, recent board elections, they brought in someone that thinks that all romance is pornography, um, which, I mean, yes, it's smut, but it's good smut. Like, it's delicious, beautiful smut. Why would you, anyway. So pay attention to those things, um, because they're really loud and have spent 10 years organizing this movement. Um, but we actually have um, like good judgment on our side, and I think as long as we organize, we will defeat them. And love, can, love can be loud too, so... You know. Love is loud, especially when paired with action. Perfect. Did, did, I, did I see we had one up here? Yeah, we have a question. Yes. I love your Metallica t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask, do you remember the first book you read with queer representation and what that meant for you? Yes. I don't know that I remember the f first one. I feel like there were lots, I feel like I'm, I'm sure I read books uh, where it was either subtextual or where they died, um, or both, like a separate piece. John Knowles, that coward should have just made it gay. It's fine, don't worry. Uh, I'll always have a bone to pick with that book. Um, but I think, um, I don't remember if I read Jandy Nelson's I'll Give You the Sun, or Becky Albertalli's Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda first, but those two I read very close together. Actually, no, I think I'll Give You the Sun was in 2014. I think it was in 2014. So I think maybe that one was the first one that, like, was happy about, and, like, where I, like, saw my own youth in it. I think, yeah, those two books both mean a lot to me. What about you? Do you have an answer to this question, Ready? Um, Am I putting you on the spot? Is it too much pressure? Actually, your book, Darius the Race, not okay. That's like the first book I saw that I really saw myself in. Oh, That's amazing. Thank you. So, as far as keeping my creative spark, um, my bills help me keep that creative spark. Um, <laughs> my bills and my deadlines. And going out and living life uh, really is a necessary part of the process for me. Um, being out with friends, um, taking trips, going for walks, uh, interacting with other art, whether it's going to museums, watching movies, spending, you know, a thousand hours on Baldur's Gate 3. Um, I, yeah, I have to go live life, and that's how I keep my spark. As far as my process, uh, I, I do not trust Google Docs, and I encourage anyone who uses Google Docs to write in to stop that immediately. In fact, there was a romance writer that recently had a lovely article in, I forget which news outlet, um, about how due to um, Google Docs sort of, you know, scans things to make sure they're not in violation of terms of service, and so it just deleted her romance novel and locked her out of her account. Um, so, and had a very opaque appeal process for getting her stuff back. Um, so I, I reject the cloud for anything except for, like, backups. And I also always have physical backups as well. Uh, I actually use uh, Pages. I'm in the Apple ecosystem for good or ill. Uh, so yeah, Apple Pages is what I write in. Um, and then I always like get stuff back from my editor in Microsoft Word, which is the worst program ever invented by humans. Um, and so I'm like, well, let me see. Uh, there's, uh, there's a certain, for a while I can like import it back into Pages. There gets to be a certain point where like, like once a copy editor has had at it, there's like formatting and there's like um, like comments in it that like pages can't always translate well. I'm like, okay, now I have to use Word. Um, but I mostly, uh, Scrivener overwhelms me. It has too many options. Uh, I have a number of friends that swear by Scrivener, but it's just not for me. Uh, I uh, tend to do like sort of the business of authoring in the mornings and then have my lunch and then do my writing in the afternoons because I find I'm most creative in the afternoons. Uh, I have a stand-up desk with a little walking pad underneath it, and so I uh, walk on my little treadmill. Uh, I, uh, I have a laptop with like a little stand and an external monitor and like an external keyboard, which looks like a typewriter, but isn't a typewriter, but it makes nice clacky sounds. Um, and I tend to use the Pomodoro method, 
so I'll like write for 20 minutes and take a 10 minute break. And at the start of every 20 minute session, I'll take like a minute or two and write by hand about like what I, what I think I'm gonna write for the next 20 minutes. And I find like the physicality of writing with a pen and several years ago, back when I had a, a day job and stability, uh, I bought my, it was like my first like big boy job with health insurance, and so I bought myself a really nice fountain pen to celebrate it, and so I still use that fountain pen, uh, and then write on whatever like free notebooks I've gotten as swag. Like I don't know, I don't know if anyone else in here accumulates free notebooks at the rate that I do. So I, there, I, those are always like my my writing notebooks where I'm just like I'll write a few sentences of like here's what I think I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes, and then I'll type at it. And usually I have like an amount of work I want to get done during the day, but I also have like a five o'clock done, so either I'll hit that work and finish early, or I'll hit five o'clock and be like, hi, it's time for dinner, I'm done writing today. Uh, I don't usually work on the weekends, but if I have an onerous deadline and I'm behind, I will work on the weekends. And if things are very, very dire with deadlines, I get out what's called my writing juice, which is when I drink with a bottle of wine next to me. <laughs> when I write with a bottle, bottle of wine. Of wine. <laughs> Why, write with a bottle of wine next to me. I do not recommend that for anyone. It's not healthy, it's not sustainable, but Every so often, I'm like, I'm like this is my yeah, this is my emergency writing life. Like, break glass in case of emergency. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Did I cover all the things? Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions from the crowd? Yes, I see another one up front. Metallica. Metallica. What is your name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Nice to meet you, Rebecca. Nice to meet you as well. Um, so I know, like, I about this new book, Right on Bear Spray, um, it, you, like, went over a lot of, like, feeling, like, disconnected from your culture as, like, someone, like, I'm, like, the challenge of that and the struggle of that. I was wondering, like, is that something you've, like, dealt with yourself or, like, just, like, the community around you or where that comes from? Yeah, um, much like Darius, uh, I'm, uh, from a, I, well, I have an Iranian father and a white mother. And uh, most of my family doesn't live in Iran, but they do live in Vancouver, British Columbia. And so growing up, I would like see them over summer vacation and then not see them for a year. And um, there was a disconnect. I was never as included in any part of the family as those who were like together all the time. And I didn't speak Persian, so I didn't, couldn't always communicate with them as, uh, as well. And so in some ways, Darius's story is sort of a, like an amplification of what I felt. Uh, I think it's not an, it's not biography, it's not autobiography, but I think it's emotionally autobiography, if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, I think most of the things Darius felt, I felt at some point or another. Anybody else have a question? Go once, go twice. I have one more question. Go for it. Uh, so here at Watermark, we like to ask the authors, are they reading anything of note that they would like to mention to the crowd? Ooh, uh, I just finished um, Natalie C. Parker's Come Out, Come Out, a queer young adult uh, horror, uh, which comes out also the same day, actually, I'll have what he's having. And I think Natalie's doing something here at Watermark as Natalie well. Natalie will be here for an event. We'll have that posted up soon. She will be visiting in October. So, so I'm excited for that. Uh, I'm excited for Julian Winter's adult romance debut, I Think They Love You, which comes out in, I want to say, the end of January. Uh, so I'm very excited for that. Uh, and I'm really excited for uh, Julian Sierra's next Christmas oh, launch column. Yeah, yeah. Ronch 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 Ronch. Ronch. Uh, if you haven't read them, yeah, that's what that's they awesome. are. <laughs> and, uh, and Nisha Sharma's uh, Marriage and Masti, which is uh, sort of a, a daisy modern uh, reimagining of um, Twelfth Night. Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, mm -hmm. is really fun and is her, the third in her If Shakespeare Was an Auntie series. And I think it's the best of the bunch. Thank you for sharing with us. You're welcome. Okay, no more questions? Oh, oh, oh a follow-up, oh. yes. <laughs> Bonus round. <laughs> that just, do you have an author that you look up to? Oh, um, I think one of my heroes is probably Laurie Hall Sanderson, um, who just, um, cares very deeply for young people, um, is really mission driven, and I think has really dedicated her life and her artistry in the service of young people, and I think that's really amazing. And was just she was just recognized by the King of Sweden for that, so yeah, she won the uh, uh, Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award, which is 
like a five million Kronart prize given in honor of the lady who wrote Pippi Longstockings, who was apparently Swedish. Uh, so yeah, and so she just won that and like donated a big chunk of it to fight book bannings. So I think yeah, that's she's my hero. Yeah, that's a good that's a good person to be your hero. Um, so you've written YA, you've written adult, you have two uh, two juve books. One being uh, the recent uh, Bajan Always Wins, mm -hmm. right? If you haven't read it, it's adorable, it's so cute. Um, if you have a young person in your life who always wants to win and uh, doesn't understand how that affects their relationship, Bajan Always Wins is for you. It's, it's quite cute. Uh, where do you see your, your writing the next two in this series? Where do you see yourself going from there? Um, well, I have another picture book uh, called T is Love about, surprise, surprise, T. Um, <laughs> that comes out, I think, in 2025. Uh, and then I have three other young adult projects that I can't really talk about because they haven't been announced yet. Um, I think that's all I have in the hopper right now. Something, I don't know, publishing is weird because like, you're always working several years into the future. Uh, and so sometimes I can't always keep track of that. That's why I have my calendar at home to tell me what I'm doing. Um, but yes, I think probably the next thing you will see from me is either Tia's Love or the second romance, depending on how schedules end up working out. That's so exciting. May I ask, who is next in line? You may ask, the next is Ramin. Oh, I have to save Arya for last. Arya is the best for last. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I will wait. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight and conversating with us. We love having you, and we would love to see you again for one of your next books. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, to Ryan, to Ryan